And when we do get a new way of doing things, it sometimes does bring up this group, so-called self-proclaimed experts. And it's interesting to see so many people calling themselves an expert. The more someone calls themselves an expert, the less expert they are. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, and welcome to today's episode. In today's show, we have both Jack Kosakowski and Rob Jepson, and I'm asking them, who should we be relying on for our sales information? Who is better at helping us close more deals? Sales influencers, the people who write books and do consulting and all that good stuff, or the sales practitioners, the people who are still in the trenches, the VP of sales, and the even individual salespeople themselves. I ask, where should we focus? You can find out more about Jack and Rob over in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.red forward slash 233. And Jack mentions an event at the end of this episode. If you want to find out more about that, head over to crushq4sales.com. And with that all said, let's jump into today's interview. Rob, Jack, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Woo-hoo. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. Good stuff. I'm enjoying the energy already, mate. So let's jump straight into this. And this is a real bugbear for me. The audience, I've heard me talk about it in the past on the show. And that is the gap, the seemingly the gap between a lot of the sales influencers that are coming on shows like mine. And, and clearly, I don't accept all of them on the show. And then the real practitioners that are kind of in the trenches and really crushing it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm sure there's plenty of rabbit holes that we can go down as well with this topic. But Jack, let me start by asking you, mate. Is there a gap here? Is it is it just me perceiving this? Or is there a gap between the information that some sales influencers, quote unquote, put out there versus what VPs of sales, directors of sales, even sales managers are doing in the trenches and they're finding effective right now in 2016? Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, there's a huge gap. And, and and I don't necessarily think that that's, you know, always a bad thing, right? Um, you know, there are people that haven't, you know, maybe truly sold for 30 years that wrote a book that do know how to sell. I mean, I know people like that, right? But I think, you know, the most important, the most important piece of this pie is to say, where are, with all the innovation going on, right, and technology and sales and marketing, where are the people that are in the weeds that are experiencing this stuff, where's their content? Why aren't they educated? And, you know, a good example, a good prime example would be, you know, I get sales leaders that come after me all the time, and it's a lot less now, I would say, but it's say social selling, what a joke, right? And the funny thing is that these guys, don't, these guys and gals, I go look, they don't even have Twitter accounts. They don't have a, an active LinkedIn, right? Or maybe they check it once in a while. So they're, you know, these people are are trying to come after what's happening, the, the shift in, in sales right now, all these things that are happening, they're trying to come after something that they know nothing about because they're not even there mm-hmm. yet, right? That's a scary thing to me. And I think, you know, until I started talking about social selling as a salesperson, you know, people thought it was fluff for a really long time. Now that when salespeople take something over and they show result with it, that's when people start to take something serious and want to implement it. And Rob, is this... Is this a ongoing phenomenon that is perhaps even just beyond the conversation of influencers and practitioners? Is this a constant battle between the, you know, stereotypically younger individual salesperson trying to convince their management to let them use technology? You know, that's a great question. And what I get nervous about is when I make it old versus young, right? Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't like that. I don't like that juxtaposition. I think it's winning and not winning. And I think that one of the things that we need to be able to do is make sure that we're using the tools that matches the way our customers want to buy. And, you know, we're finding that more and more people are finding buyer fatigue because it's many times such a crowded marketplace. And when we do get a new way of doing things, it sometimes does bring up this generation of, not generation, this group of so-called self-proclaimed experts. And it's interesting to see so many people calling themselves an expert and I've found that the more someone calls themselves an expert, probably the less expert they are. Because if you're any good, like, you know, like, like Jack, for instance, there's lots of people that will tell you that you got to listen to Jack or other guys that are like him. Um, I, I have found myself to be very wary of the self-proclaimed visionaries and the self-proclaimed experts. But it's an interesting challenge because as things change, sometimes people that have done things for 30 years are slow to adapt to the new things, right? So I don't think it's necessarily an age thing. 
I think it's an it's it's not experience either. It's expertise. What do you have expertise in versus what do you have experience? And I think they're two different words and you can be any age and still have expertise. But it shouldn't just be I tried this once and now I think I'm better than you. Does that make <laughs> no, sense? I, I, think, I think that's a great point that Rob brings up. I, 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 I honestly could tell you that if you wanted to talk about social selling, I would say that, you know, millennials are actually worse at social selling than a lot of the baby boomer and Gen Xers and adopting social and using it the right way. So I, I would have to agree with Rob. I don't think age is age has anything to do with it. I think, you know, it's about pra- being a practitioner. Um, Gary Vee had, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm a huge fan of Gary Vee, all Gary Vee's content anymore, but he did come out with one video the other day. And, and what he said was, I might be the 40 year old, um, you know, in the office and I might be the old guy, but you know what? I know I'm a practitioner. I've always been a practitioner and I will always be a practitioner. And he said, there's not one millennial in my office that knows social media better than me. Right. And, and, and I thought, you know, that was pretty powerful because that proves the model that age doesn't matter, right? But what it, what people should be thinking about is if you are if you are the writing you know the book thirty years ago and you're doing those things, or if you are a new millennial that thinks you know everything, you know if you're not a practitioner and you don't stay passionate about it, you, you have to put yourself out there. True practitioners have to quit being selfish and keeping all the information inside of them or inside of their company, and they've got to start giving it to people and educating. I mean, it's the new digital age. It's, it's the way that things have to happen. And I think, you know, all salespeople and all marketing and business people would be better for it. Well, let me pose this to both of you. How much as a percentage, to play devil's advocate here a little bit, even though I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure on the answer to this myself, but how much of sales is just timeless? How much of, um, you know, like the equivalent of think and grow rich for business, how much of the the sales books that have been written 20 years ago, how how relevant are they still now at this point? Well, I think that some things will be timeless. You know, for instance, co- connecting to needs, that's going to always be important. I think technique and intent, though, are two different things. I've always felt like intent is more important than technique. And um, you can tell when someone's trying to technique sell you, right? I mean, <laughs> it, and it drives me crazy. I'm kind of a sales snob. I'm one of those people that I actually enjoy having people try to sell things to me so I can see what's happening. And But if you're doing it wrong, I'll, I'll throw your ass out, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm not the right guy to screw up on. So I think there's some simple things. Connect to what things that people value. I believe there's only two ways that you can be valuable. You can solve a problem someone cares about or you can achieve a result someone cares about. And it's not that it's a problem or a result. It's that they care about it. And so how you find out what they care about is important. Now, how do you do that? It used to be it might be on a phone call. Then it might be an email. It might be a a face-to-face meeting. It may be joining social conversations. But you better find out what they care about and have them tell you with their own mouth or the electronic equivalent of it or else you're wasting their time. Those kind of things, I think, are timeless. The technique that supports the intent is going to change. I believe, Will, sales has changed fundamentally in the last three to five years. Totally. You used to hear things about sales culture. Now we are in a relationship culture. You used to hear things about, you know, do it out. I'll find someone who will. Now it's, we got to help develop you and give you the tools so you can. I just think that, you know, ABC used to be always be closing. Now it's always be connecting. It's totally changed. But that thing about connecting to the things people value, I don't think it ever will. Jack, let yeah. me ask you, mate, what percentage of our time should we be spending on connecting with humans, which is timeless? and building relationships and all this stuff that we bang on about on the show all the time. And how much of our time should we be spending perhaps experimenting with new ways of going about things, which, you know, uh, it, generally it's fed down from the top or fed from uh, sales influencers. How much time should we be spending on those kind of jobs? I, I, I think the one thing that's never changed, never will, Zig Ziglar days and, and beyond, you know, relationships. We all know that relationships are the key to the sale, right? And what, and what Rob said was business value. I think that the, the problem with sales today is that with all the digital things that are going on, people look at it as the easy way out of communication, right? And, and, you're, look, and you're seeing a lot of salespeople not giving business value, which is exactly what Rob's saying because they're not talking to the right people. They're not using Preach, the communication Jack. Preach. channels. <laughs> they're, they're not using the right communication channels. And not only that, but they're not connecting with the right people, right? So that's like sales 101, but what you're talking about, I think is what I call the competitive advantage, right? In sales, to get to people, no matter what the communication channel is, 
you've got to be no matter what your what business value you're bringing them because you know what we every salesperson gives a pitch around some type of value right so you've got to figure out how do you stand out how do you get to people differently than every other sales rep did how do you lead with value and how does it get the buy, the buyer to go wow that was really interesting right how they communicated with me or how they got to me example doing a mini demo and sending it into a twitter dm right i've done that many times and the buyer's like whoa that's crazy like they automatically respond so i think you know using co the competitive advantage in sales innovation which is the tools right around the communication channels that is how you stay ahead of the times and you don't end up like blockbuster innovation always <laughs> has to happen but the vehicle which is relationships and business value will never change. Well, Rob, let me ask you this, mate, and I'm gonna frame this from the context of the Sales and Podcast. So I very yeah. consciously started the show and I still sell the ad space on the show so that I can you know, test everything we talk about that comes up, whether it be video emails, that was the last big experiment I did and I write it up in the blog for everyone to, uh, to <laughs> either see the, the horrible misery of where I've screwed up or uh, you know, clearly sometimes there's a couple of wins in there as well. So I'm very conscious of this practitioner versus influencer uh, kind of debate and, and, and back and forth that goes on. But Rob, being very blunt with all of this so that the audience can take away something real and tangible from this episode, how right. do we know who is full of, of bullshit and how do we know who we should be paying attention to when we are getting advice and guidance from people outside of the organization that we work in? That's, the, that's a great, great question. And it's a hard one. It changes because there's so many new things that are emerging that you see these people that find ways to ring a bell or bang a drum, bang a, bang a drum and maybe make them bigger than they really are, right? And, and a couple of answers come to mind. I mean, being just blunt, like you said. <laughs> um, I found that the best competitive differentiator is who your customers are, okay? If you don't have anybody else that's listening to you, that doesn't mean you're wrong. But today, it's pretty easy to get people to listen to you. And so if you don't have anybody else that's saying, yeah, what that person says is right, then I would be really nervous about it. Okay, that, That's just one that I would go with. The second is find out how much depth they have. If, if you can't drill down and find out what's more than skin deep, there probably isn't much there. Like I said, like, you know, Jack's done a great job today and, and other times. He has multiple layers of depth. It's not just what you say on top. And it's easy to try and, and surprise someone and make someone think, oh, that's a smart person. If you can't drill down and get to tactics, I find that the rubber meets the road on tactics. It can't, the bullshit is just on the very top of where you say, hey, you got a social seller. Hey, you got to connect the value. Or, hey, you got to use this channel. Or you know, any of those things. If you can't get to actual tactics, they're probably a bullshit artist. Okay? That's where I come from. And before I ask you I, the I, same I, question, Jack, before I ask you, mate, I, you can see you're keen to jump in there with your, with your thoughts on this. Um, me and Jack spoke before we could record, and this will be useful for the audience as well, of if I'm recording 35, 40 shows a month, I come across this with the influencers and the and practitioners that I deal with as well uh, that come on the, uh, the show. And probably about once, one interview out of every 35, 40 doesn't get heard purely, and I like the way you describe this, and this is how I'm going to frame it from now on, Rob, of they don't have the depth to have the conversation beyond the uh, what they've written in a book, what they have written down in blog posts. As soon as I ask them, how do we make this practical for our audience so they can use this in their next meeting? <laughs> it all falls apart for them and it's, it's, it gets a little bit embarrassing and a bit weird because we have to generally stop the podcast right there and it's an awkward conversation. <laughs> But it's, uh, I thought that'd be useful as an anecdote for the audience of my experience and probably percentage-wise as well, you can you can work out how many people that I speak to versus how many people I speak to that really add value out there. So Jack, let me ask you, mate, because you're, you're working on all these uh, conferences, live events, online courses, which we'll, we'll touch on later, but how do you know when you're inviting people to uh, you know, be part of your brand, essentially? How do you know whether these people are going to represent you well and have this depth that Rob talked about? Um, I think that, you know, you have to reach out to people. I think you've got to get the one-to-one -one conversation, um, you know, especially with the digital age, right? Is if you're reading somebody's you know, content and you're really, you know, thinking that they might be the real deal, you know, the first thing I always do with the sales, you know, especially a sales expert is I reach out an email or, or on LinkedIn after I've, you know, done some things for them. And I say, listen, I'd love to have a conversation. I'm, I'm really interested in what you have to say. 
And I think that it could really have an impact on, you know, me personally and, and, and the things that I'm doing. And, you know, A, if people don't reach out back to me, I automatically lose all, all credibility because I think that if you're going to put yourself out there, especially with content and tell people to do something and you're not willing to take their call or you're not willing to, you know, to, to communicate with them, then you're, you're full of shit right, right <laughs> away when it, from a sales perspective. But the second thing is I always ask my friends, right? I mean, I've asked Rob questions about people. Um, you know, maybe I've not connected with them one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe I've, you know, read of their book or I've read some, you know, content or seen some things they're doing. And I mean, I'll ask, you know, you will, or I'll ask Max, right? I want to ask the people that I know um, are connected to them and, and I'll get a kind of a first, you know, you can't always take that, right? You know, but I, I think if you've got the right network of people, they'll tell you, you know, what they think of somebody and, you know, you get a couple opinions and you, you can kind of figure out if, if they're the real deal and you should be, you know, following their advice because we do have to make smart decisions in sales. When you want to change a process or you want to change something or you want to, you know, go in, go all in on something, that takes up your time, that takes up your energy, and essentially it affects your bottom line. So you got to be really smart about who and what move you're making, you know, when it comes to that stuff. So let me turn this on its head for a second. So we talk about all the time on the show, personal branding, and I encourage the audience to niche down as far as they can and then become an... Uh, uh, an influencer is perhaps a strong word, but at least become known in the industry, whether that's through creating content, which is a debate in itself, whether salespeople should be creating content or selling. Uh, but essentially networking and building your personal brand, I think has real value for salespeople in this hyper-connected world that we live in. This conversation has brought up um, a point which I get asked regularly, and that is people say to me, I don't feel confident in my own skills to put myself out there from that perspective. For the audience listening now, Rob, is there a point in their careers or in their expertise where you are allowed to say that you are a, a, an influencer or you are an, an expert in your industry uh, for the, the salespeople listening specifically for those people personally? Or is it better to perhaps do what I do and just be totally honest and say, hey, I'm doing a sales podcast because I want to learn more about sales and I'm on the same level as you guys. Is it okay to call yourself an expert or do you need to like kind of let it happen i think that it i think that both sides have correctness to what you're saying okay um I, if there are certain things that have happened then it's okay to say this is the thing that i'm good at like like this what you and i are talking about this is the one thing i'm good at well i suck at everything else okay <laughs> I, i've you know but but there's a lot of reasons that i can say that i've won more stevie awards from the american business awards than anybody else in the world right now i have 15 gold stevie awards and so my peers have voted that what I'm doing is, is something that's meaningful. And when I speak, that's kind of what I use to get people's attention that, listen, when I talk today, not only have I won 15 of these international awards, I'm actually the head of the judges committee now. So I get to vote on what makes something awesome. So I see a lot of these sales orgs. And so I only use it in the context of I speak at 50 to 100 events a year. And sometimes it's important when you get in front of a large group to say, let me tell you why I'm here. Okay. But I think you got to be careful how often you let you pull you uh, you hit that hammer. Does that make sense? Because if you keep hitting that hammer too much, it's like quit telling me how great you are <laughs> and give me something that I could use, right? And very quickly you get off of that and you get into the de the tactics, you get into the depth, you get into the content. And the way you're doing it, I think that you are probably I like your style because yeah, you're interviewing all these people. You probably have one of the greater uh, depths of knowledge on people's approaches to selling right now of, of anybody that I would think of in our industry, just because you're talking to so many, you're seeing who's good. You're seeing who's full of shit. You, you can probably know inside five minutes if you're talking to someone who knows what they're doing. And so you, you, by virtue of doing that, you've become an expert in doing that. I think that you have to let it happen. But once you have something, you, you, you need to talk about why you're an expert in the context that it's relevant. If you just talk about, I'm an expert, I'm great, look at me. You know, one of my favorite things is when someone says, I'm a visionary, and then I put a comma, <laughs> said no visionary ever, right? A visionary doesn't call himself that. An expert, if they keep labeling themselves as an expert too much, you lose the ability to have someone really take it seriously. So I think it needs to just happen, but in the context where it really makes a difference, when you're landing that big customer, you say, listen, the reason you want me here helping you is because this is one thing that I can help you with, and here's why here's how here's how i've done it here's how i've done it better than anyone else you know not that i'm better else here's how i've done it better than anyone else that's completely different and i think that that is the kind of thing that people can 
very quickly say, okay, I'll take a chance here. Because ultimately, the first time someone trusts you, they are taking a chance. You used the word trust earlier, and I like that. Jack used relationships. I believe trust is the currency that we trade on in relationships, okay? It's a currency, trust. And we either are building it or we're, or we're losing it. And we have to make sure we're reinforcing why they ch took a chance on us. And that's a really healthy attitude. You took a chance on me. I, when a customer takes a chance on me, I always want to make them never regret taking a chance on me. And that's what makes you an expert. Do you have that expert status then? Do you, and, and this perhaps will even sum up our conversation, do you need to have the evidence in place before you're an expert or can you be this visionary and, uh, and get away with writing books that don't make any sense and do speaking gigs and then come on podcasts and, and feed everyone your bullshit? Is that, can people do that? Or does yeah. everyone start off in a position of having some kind of evidence that what, they, what they're no. talking about works? People are bullshitting all day long, okay? And sometimes, I mean, let's be honest. Of course you can do it. It happens all the time. You just told us on this podcast, there are some that you never air because you saw through it. True or false, right? True. yeah. And, and so people do it all the time. The question is, can you turn that puffer fish mentality? And that is, it's literally one of the laws of entrepreneurship that I teach when I teach entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneur groups, is this law of puffer fish. You've got to try and look a little bigger than you are, right? Um, you want people to feel comfortable hiring you, listening to you, buying your stuff. But you very quickly have to turn that into something actionable and something tangible. You know, Jack brought up earlier in this podcast that, you know, he's done a lot with social. Well, there's a lot of people that gave it a shot and didn't see anything happen. He's one of the ones that figured out how to make the needle move. And so the reason people and his brand grew and people listened to him and guys like you want him on your podcast is he's a handful of people that's figured out how to do it and do it repeatedly. And you, at some point, have to stop being a puffer fish and make it repeatable so it can scale. Well, Jack, I want to wrap up the conversation with a question to yourself, Jack, and then to you, Rob. And we've done very well not to call anyone out or slag anyone off directly. But I think there's an opportunity here to perhaps touch on and promote a couple of the people that we're all fond of and that we believe have this depth. So, Jack, start with you, mate. And you can't use Rob and you can't stroke his ego with this one. But well, <laughs> who are the top two sales influencers that we should be following and listening to right now? Um, I, I have to say Rob. I mean, I brought him on the show. No, but but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, Rob is one of those guys that I'm, you know, Gabe via Bazaar and I are working on getting him out there, right? He's one of the guys that, you know, I re met through, you know, my friendships and relationships and said, why the heck haven't I met this guy? And why am I not <laughs> reading his stuff, right? So, you know, he's a prime example. I would tell you, Oh man, there's you know there's there's a lot of good good people out there. Who comes to mind? Who's who just is the first at the top of your mind? You know what? And I know this is you know he's one of my best friends, but Gabe Via Mazar, man, like, I mean, he's out there. He's he's out there a little bit. He should be out there more. But I mean, he is got a marketing title, but a sales acumen that's unbelievable. I learn so much from him every freaking day. So you know, Max Altschuler. I mean, I. I know from you know CEO of Sales Hacker, it's he's kind of like in your position, right? I mean, he's a guy that's around real founders of real SaaS companies, real salespeople of real SaaS companies, and he's feeling the real in the weeds practitioner pains of all this stuff, right? And he's doing it, right? He's growing a business. I like those people. I like those mm -hmm. conversations where I can like really talk to somebody about what's going on in your business? What are you feel? I want to feel the pains, you know, their pains, just like they're feeling mine. And when that happens and they can give me actual strategies from their pain to fix something, that's when I light up, man. And that, and that's what I love about the sales, you know, world and, and the people that are in it. Good stuff. Rob, let me ask you as well. And even though Jack totally ignored me, uh, you can't stroke Jack's ego with this question. <laughs> Who are the top two sales influencers from your perspective who you who you personally are excited to learn more about right now? I have to echo first ones that, that Jack did. Gabe Mazar, yes. Max, yes. But I'm going to add to the list. But I want to check the ones that he put. Great choices, my man. And, and you know, I've already endorsed Jack, so I, I beat you to the punch. <laughs> right? I already beat you to the punch. This one, it won't surprise you. This is a guy who's really blended the ability to stay old school and new school, and I love him. I refer to him uh, affectionately as the godfather. His name is Jim Dickey, okay? 
And uh, he ran the uh, CSO Insights State of the Sales World uh, study for the last 24 years, was acquired by Miller Hyman, still sits a lot of boards and, in, and spends a lot of personal time helping young tech companies get off the ground. So he's very into social. He's very into the young companies. He's been around long, so he sees what, what works. He knows the answer to what's the test of time. If you don't read that study, that's one that I get super excited to read, and I stay close to Jim. Jim is a good guy to watch. That, that's the first one. Um, another one that we haven't touched on much yet, and I think it's it's a topic that's so huge in the leadership world. Okay, uh, leadership in my mind is so I think sales is the most important discipline in business. It's it's easy for me to justify why if you don't think sales is the most important, take it away and see how long your business lasts. Okay, <laughs> um, so if sales is the most important role, then sales leadership becomes really important. Fair to say, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's a lot of people who really are doing a lot of good things inside of sales leadership. And, and I like uh, some of the things you see with some of the usual suspects in CEB. And so I, I would be dumb if I didn't throw that out. But I think the best sales leader, thought leader, is a guy that's written a lot of books. He's not full of shit. It needs to be a book on every single person's uh, bookshelf. It's John Maxwell. John Maxwell's 21 Laws of Leadership. He says, follow them and people will follow you. I believe it's something that everyone needs to read. And, and those are two people that I can't get enough of right now. Good stuff. Well, we will link to all those people, uh, perhaps their blogs and their Twitter accounts, and that kind of thing in the show notes so that everyone listening to this right now can have a, a jump up and a head start into separating what we started the conversation with, separating perhaps the people who are talking nonsense without that practitioner experience. And, you know, I, and I, when you guys say names like that, that makes me want to dive into them a lot further myself. Uh, personally, because obviously I respect both of you guys. So we'll link to all that in the show notes over at salesman.red. And with that, gents, I've got a couple of questions that ask everyone that comes on the show. So what I think we'll do, we'll do quick fire between Rob, then Jack, the Rob, then Jack. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so first one, Rob, <laughs> while, I, <laughs> while I recover. First one, Rob, who is the world's greatest salesperson? Other than myself, I'm joking. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. You have to have a healthy ego without being an <laughs> asshole, right? Um, boy, that's a question. The world's greatest salesperson. You know, I, uh, I, I find I get really motivated by Tony Robbins right now. I love Tony Robbins. Uh, he's an easy guy to get excited about. He's selling more than just products. He sells vision, and I love that. Nice. Okay, Jack, next one for you. If you could punch someone in the face, anyone in the world, who would it be and why? <laughs> Well, man, this is this is gonna go against my Christian values, but uh, <laughs> I, would have to say, I would have to say like be a double punch to Kanye, Kanye <laughs> Kardashian. Next one, Rob. What if dollar size is possible? What's the biggest deal you've ever closed? Dollar size? It's it's a fifteen million dollar contract. Nice, good size. Jack, it was, it was an awesome deal. Um, next one, I've probably asked this before, Jack. Um, but I'm sure you'll have a different answer. It seems as we've not had you on for a couple of months now. What is one book or resource that you'd recommend to the sales and podcast audience? I'm into Simon Sinek right now. Um, anything with Simon Sinek, I would say that every leader should be reading because you know there's there's something there that's special, and what you take out of it, I don't know. But I mean, it, it, it's it's life changing content. Any in speci any specifically, and I'll link to his, uh, I think it was a TED talk he did that I got a lot of value in the show notes, but are there any specific books Leader, or anything? Leaders Eat Last, is mm -hmm. that right? Leaders, I think it's Leaders Eat Last. That's a phenomenal book. I think, you know, what to, to the point Rob talked about, right? Sales leadership. Um, why I think, you know, practitioners and, and people taking out, but, you know, kind of taking back the content and the, and the conversation and the, the processes because it's leadership, right? We need... We need salespeople, you know, not being okay with not selling like everybody else, and, and and they need to have the strategies around that. We need to, you know, let loose, and that that comes with kind of Simon Sinek's ideology. And Rob, I'm going to give you the the uh, I was going to say honor then, but <laughs> that's massively uh, overstating the show itself. But I've, I've said it now, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with it. I'm going to give you stick the honor of wrapping up the show, Rob, with a question to ask everyone that comes on. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice that you'd give him to help him become better at sales? Bet on yourself earlier, um, for sure. Uh, that, that would be the first one. 
The second, the second one would be pick them, pick the right mentor sooner. I, I didn't realize the importance of mentors until I was in my thirties. And if I'd have done that when I was in my twenties, that would have sped everything up by 10 years. Do you, do you feel like you've got the right mentors now? Or do you feel like if I asked you this in 10 years time, you'd still probably refine it and narrow it down further? I'm sure I would refine it. I'm sure I would. <laughs> it's a really a question. You're a smart dude. Um, there are two in particular that in the middle of my career changed things. They told me things that other people were afraid to tell me. They worked on skills that I didn't realize I needed to have. It redefined who I was and it, it put me, it had me take some opportunities that I probably wouldn't have taken. And they were the ones who encouraged me to bet on myself earlier. I, I, I really think that I, I would have spent a lot of time earlier on doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on the things that made me really made my engine turn. And I, you know, I came out of that college environment where you go to college, get a job, put in your dues. And, you know, after about a few years of that, you realize that's going to take too long. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't want to say that experience is overrated. It's not. You've got to have it. But I would have bet on myself earlier. And I bet on myself when I had the right mentors. When my mentors put me in the right place and they teach me what I need to know. And I guess that to some extent, I wouldn't have met them if I hadn't done some of those other things. Mentors for me were a big, big deal. And maybe this goes to the whole topic, Will. I was able to find the real deals and not the bullshit artists because there's some bullshit mentors too. For sure. And one final thing on this, and then Jack, you can tell us where we can find out more about you and we can wrap up the show. But Ben on yourself is something that sounds, it's simple to say, but clearly there's a lot of barriers to go through. And you mentioned uh, Tony Robbins earlier, which may uh, you know, have been a, a mentor from afar perhaps with this. But this is something I see with salespeople all the time, especially I get a lot of salespeople who want to go that extra mile into like leadership or want to start companies using their sales skills they picked up in B2B. Is there a way that right, practically right now that you can share with the audience to help them to, to improve their ability to bet on themselves and perhaps take more risk. Was there a defining moment or a defining thing that allowed you to do that? Or was it just a gradual shift over time? Was there, so was there a gradual shift over time? No, there, there absolutely was. There was at some point I was thinking more about, um, i to get this right. I was thinking more about security, the S word, right? And, and, and I wanted the security of, will I be able to do what I need for my family? Will I be able to do and, 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 I guess all those things that I was programmed and, and what I realized was I am worth to someone else only what they can pay me and still make a margin on me. I want all of it. I want what I'm worth plus the margin. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, I don't want someone making margin on me. I want it all. I, I found that I may be more greedy and I, and I think that's a good thing. And, and I found that there are skills and I found that there were things that I was good at. And ultimately when I left to start Exvoyant where I am now, uh, I did it with customers coming with me, which was awesome because um, it made it easier for me to bet on myself because I knew what I was capable of doing for these people. And I had customers that wanted to work with me. So that would have been hard to do early on. You're right. That would have been a hard thing to do. And my experience made it so I could do that and have and have uh, the ability to bet on myself. Maybe I would have bet on myself earlier. I would have taken risks earlier. I would have still made some of these relationships. Uh, as it worked out, it was great because I took relationships with me. But I believe that's the one thing that's portable. Relationships go with you wherever you go. And as I built up enough of these relationships, and maybe that's the other thing, and I'm rambling now, Will, and I apologize. But I think with today's tools, it's easier to build relationships than it's ever been. And if we aren't focused on the building of relationships and having them go from just a face on a screen or a like, a little thumb, how do you build real relationships? How do people trust you? How to, and my definition of a network is having relationships that you can count on before you need them. If you only do something with them when you need them, and Jack's so good at this, he talks about delivering value all the time. You know, if you only talk to people when you need them, they very quickly find out they don't need you. And so I know I'm rambling. I'm sorry. You're going to have to edit that down a little no, bit. No, that'll be a good two minute clip right there, man. This is, that's a good two minute clip right there. <laughs> I have my own definitions for all of these things. And and, and I believe that that's why I was able to bet on myself is I had the relationships I could count on and I hadn't tapped them to the point where it was one sided. And these people were excited to help me. And it's been I think I think what he you know, one of the just to play off of that is if you're going to make if you're going to bet on yourself, you know, you've got to put in the, the work ahead of time to get to the point where you will bet on yourself. I don't think a lot of people will put in all the grunt work, all the, you know, and all the time to 
to screw up, to suck at something, to, you know, get ridiculed, to tell people that you're doing something wrong. You know, you've got to be able to go through all of that before you get to a point where I think you can really bet on yourself. Nobody wants to do all the legwork in, that, that comes before the I'm going to bet on myself part and I know that it's going to work, right? <laughs> so that just comes with, you know, a, a really, a really heavy mindset, a really heavy focus around this is what I love. This is what I'm passionate about. Nobody's going to tell me no. I'm going all in and you got to fail, fail, fail. And then there's a point I think you go, bam, I'm going to bet on myself and I won't lose. But you only have to listen to the first 50 episodes of this show to, <laughs> to, to realize the kind of the momentum that we didn't have and the, how the, the quality, the video, the audio, everything sucked. The quality of the conversations were, you know, quote unquote average until about 50 onwards. Um, so that, and that was about the time I started to better myself as well and, and take all of this more seriously and throw more of, you know, the money that I'd saved up to start up the company into the promotion of things. And, um, and I think that's a wise words from you, Jack. And with that, mate, tell us where we can find out more about you. Yeah, so um, at Jack Kazakowski one you know, you could tweet at me, you know, connect with me on, or actually, I just changed my handle. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm J at Jack Kazakowski now. No one finally uh, got free. But, you know, what I would say is, you know, after this whole conversation, one of the coolest things that's going to happen in the next two weeks is we're having an actual practitioner, you know, I'll call it an online sales event that's real practitioners giving you real actionable advice to help real salespeople with real problems crush their Q4 quota, right? You know, Rob is going to be one of the speakers. We have, we're being, you know, really, really strict on the content, right? We've got out, we've handpicked real practitioners at awesome companies, enterprise companies, Adobe, Salesforce, um, you know, we've got startups, all angles. So check that out. And I think if you want to start with some real actionable content with real practitioners that you can trust, you know, that's a good place to start. Good stuff. And Rob, where can we find out more about you, mate? So my company is xvoyant, xvoyant.com. Check us out there. Find me on Twitter. I'm at Rob Jepson. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm at Rob Jepson. I will be at Jack's event. I'm excited. We have three really actionable tactics on how to make fourth quarter be something that's meaningful for you. Those are the best places to find me. I, I, I will promise you I'm not that guy that Jack talked about that if you reach out, I don't reach back. And, uh, and I would love to meet any of the people to talk through. Most importantly, how do we make how we lead our sales team our most defensible competitive advantage? Jack, Rob, I want to thank you for your insights. I want to thank you for the energy as well. It's been a fun one, this one. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us on the Sales and Podcast. Thanks to both of you. And thanks for having me, Will. And there we have it. Thank you, Jack, Rob, for coming on the show. I appreciate it, mate. Thank you, Sales Nation, as always, for tuning in. It means a lot. It means a lot that we can put the show together, that we can build bigger guests on, more guests on. And tell me what you think about this as well. Do you like this three-way format, even maybe four or five-way and have a panel on the show? Let me know your thoughts. Email me, will at salesman.red. And if you guys want more of that, we'll do more of it. Simple as that. So with that all said, I will speak with you again on tomorrow's episode. Mm -hmm.